so great to have you back on with us. Welcome. Thank you. I am so excited to be here. Dana, today, talking about excited, today we're actually going to talk about your new book, Calm the Chaos. Yes, we are. What a great title. I think for every Thank parent, you. they're like, what do I need to do? How do we calm the chaos? Yes, absolutely. Um, and first and foremost, I'll tell you, you're not getting rid of the chaos, but you're learning how to live with the chaos and 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 live calmly with it because it just turns into like happy chaos instead of it being the chaos that ruins our, our day and just leaves us stressed out, worried, and all of those things. So really, my understanding is that the hope of this book is to provide a roadmap for parents through those really challenging moments. A hundred percent. And from the most challenging moments to the everyday moments. But it really is about being able to get through those really, really tough moments. So you're having a battle to get your kid out the door in the morning, or your kid is refusing to go to bed, or the siblings are fighting, or your child is having tantrums or meltdowns, whatever the worst scenario is. And then building a relationship after getting through those and getting proactive, creating plans that work for everyone, and then building a family that works together, advocates for each other and empowers each other. That's kind of the end result that we're aiming for. Well, that's beautiful. And I think about it, even with my own two little girls, what I want is to be able to help them through those challenging moments and still be highly connected even during the really, really tough minutes yes. of the day. Yes, 100% not, you know, connection is one of the key elements in our framework because everything we do is based on science and communication and relationships and the latest in the science that we've gotten over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. And, but it's in a way that the average bear can understand it because, you know, for myself, we were talking just before this, um, I'm just coming off of a, tri a trip. So my word retrieval is kind of low. My um, executive functioning skills are really low. My ability to focus. Well, when we're parenting in a stressful situation, we're overwhelmed, we're stressed out. It's hard to focus on things. And then somehow we feel bad about ourselves when we can't get through this meaty information that's really helpful. And so really, I wanted to make it as simple as possible for parents at any situation to get the most important information they need to make a step forward. I love it. And I know too, as a mom, often I'm exhausted. I want to open up a book that goes, how do I do this? What do I need to do right now? Yeah. And that's exactly what your book offers. Yeah. And just something that you know, I don't tell a whole lot of people, but I grew up undiagnosed ADHD. And so growing up, books were something that I was interested in, but something that I could never quite grasp or, you know, wrap my head around. I would read a page and then I'd read it again and again and again, and I would forget what I read by the end of the page. And so I still graduated with honors and all of that, but it's because I got really good at listening to people and listening to conversations and then digesting that and comprehending it that way. Cliff Notes were also my friend. And so then when I got into college, I finally had a teacher who, it was actually a children's literature book or yeah, children's literature class for early childhood teachers. And I fell in love with reading and it was because it was like small, it was larger text, it was big spaces and I could finally read it. And so this book is actually designed to be as accessible as possible. So it's got a lot of white space, a lot of lists, a lot of doodles, and then every section or step in the journey is broken down into no longer than five pages. So you can pick it up, you can read it for five minutes and be done with a section and have an action step and then not pick it up for another month and not feel guilty about it, not feel like you're falling behind. And it's really easy to just pick right back up and then take action on it. Beautiful. So I know that you have a soft spot for our highly spirited children. Talk to us about highly spirited kiddos. Yeah, so I have a soft spot for any of those kids that others deem as uh, too much or not enough. I would probably say that I fall into that category growing up. Um, I was always considered too emotional, too loud, too strong-willed, like all those things. And um, and I'm an incredibly emotional person. Uh, when I was really young, my mom grounded me from watching movies because I was so sensitive. I would watch this movie. I remember it clearly. It was the movie Mask. I don't know if you remember that movie. Yeah. 
Okay, it was my favorite movie, and I would watch that movie, but I would sob, sob to the point of like, you know, when you're like trying to catch your breath, and you're like, <laughs> like that, you know? My mom was like, I ground you from watching sad movies. You are not allowed to watch movies anymore. And like one time I like was trying to bid on something, you know, and I was really upset with my mom and I wrote out this letter and she saved it till the very end of her life. But it said, I promise if you do X, Y, Z, I will never cry again. You know, like that just is proof of how emotional I was that I knew how much that meant to my mom if I wasn't going to cry so much. And so, um, so I have a soft spot because I was one. And also, um, you know, I'm raising a very sensitive soul. And then, you know, I've worked with thousands of parents around the world. And, you know, the thing is, is I, whether we're talking about kids who are incredibly emotional or we're dealing with kids who are highly susceptible to like sensory input and it's just overwhelming for them whatever way we're looking at it, I think it's important for us to realize that it's not about changing who they are, but it's about seeing this as a flip side to the, you know, whatever struggle comes with it, there's a flip side that is also their superpower. And so if we're trying to just focus on the positives, oh, they're really compassionate, they're really helpful, but you know, you don't need to be so sensitive, right? Then we need to realize that, nope, you kind of get the sensitivity with the compassion. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, we have to, reward's not the word, right word, I know, I, celebrate. So we have to celebrate even the things that are hard about that personality because it's part of who our kid is. And we don't want them to believe that they need to like dig out pieces of themselves to fit in. Oh, I know that I think so often in society that is the exact message that is given. Yeah, it's like shave off little bits of yourself so you fit into this nice pretty box. And it's like, no, 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 let's figure out a way to still keep those bits of you, but not need to have a fit or not need to like miss out on things just because this is who you are. Mm -hmm. Okay, so your roadmap has five steps when parents hit those, those bumps. Can we walk through those five steps together? Yeah, absolutely. So there's five stages. The first one is ride the storm. So this is, it sounds really funny, but it's your plan before you have a plan. And what I mean by that is a lot of times we jump in as parents and we want to fix and solve and create and, and, and make everything go away, right? And we want to create visual charts or we want to create a schedule or a routine or a new rule. And it doesn't matter how good your strategy is. If if you're dealing with something today, if you're listening to this podcast today and your child meltdowns over, melts down over the smallest thing, has arguments over their socks, doesn't like the food they're, that they're served, tomorrow that's not going to change, no matter how good of a strategy you have. So you need a plan until you have a plan to figure out the things that are going on. And so the Ride the Storm plan is that. It's a plan for the adult themselves, how to get through the toughest moments without fixing, without solving a lot of times without saying a single word. I like to think of it as like holding space for your kid to have their big emotions, to have those, you know, whatever they're going through, however they're processing it and let go of the idea that now is when I have to solve it. I actually remind myself now is not the time. Now is not the time, you know? Um, and even when you're trying to help your child through a situation, and you're able to talk to them, it's still not about fixing. And so that ride the storm one really is about yourself. It's about anchoring yourself with a, um, a grounding memory that reminds you, hey brain, you're safe. Because if we don't get grounded, then we're gonna see our kids as these big bad bears and we're gonna be reactive instead of being able to respond and be able to show up in a calm, peaceful way. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I know that in a mantra that I often use is, um, it's actually close to your title, be the calm, not the chaos, Tanya. Be the calm, be the calm. When my girls are at it, it's like, just be the calm in this instance. Yes, yes, that's so good. And so the second stage is one that we all try to skip, especially us mamas who are so giving and so compassionate towards our kids and want to help others so much. And that is the time and energy reserves. So often we want to skip into, again, still this fixing and we want advice on how to help our kids. But if we don't have any fuel in our tank, and I know it's such a cliche to say like, can't pour from an empty cup, but it's so 
true. And so this stage is all about creating teeny tiny habits, like one minute habits that actually boost your energy and you remove the things that are draining you and no, you can't remove your husband. Like it's just like the, the actual things like scrolling or overthinking or worrying. You're trying to remove one thing that drains you add in one thing that boosts your energy. Maybe that's just stepping outside at the first thing in the morning and putting your feet on the ground. Maybe that's drinking your water or taking your vitamins or it's stopping for one moment. I was on a call just earlier today. And she said her thing that she does every morning as part of her morning ritual is she gets up and she turns on her salt lamp. And if she turns it on and moves past and doesn't even realize she's turned it on, she actually stops herself, goes back, pauses and gets mindful about turning it on. Oh, beautiful. It's like her reminder to really pause and be mindful of what she's doing before she starts her day. We would call that a shift. So one thing that really focuses on your own mindset before you go into your day, that way you have energy to handle whatever gets thrown at you. No, oh, that's beautiful. Um, and, so as we go through, I'm just going to relate back to what I'm currently doing. Yeah. When I'm optimal, I am going to the gym before the kids wake up because it's something that's just for me. Yeah. That, that is the best takeaway that I take that I've invested in my bucket before they're even up and awake and moving yeah. often. I love that so much. And we would consider that the the empower part of that plan of this stage. And that's where you're activating your body. And so for people who want to give themselves some self-care, they want to take care of themselves. Sometimes they'll think, oh, I have to go to the gym to be able to take care of myself. And what I encourage parents to do is move more today than you moved yesterday. Mm -hmm. So if that means that you typically sit behind a desk, or if that means that you don't typically go for a walk, then just walk your stairs one time today. Tomorrow, walk them twice, right? Or uh, walk around your house and then tomorrow walk twice. There was one point where I was feeling like I couldn't leave my house because my son was having such massive meltdowns. And so I wanted to be able to do this move more today than I move yesterday. And so I actually would walk my kitchen table and I would go one round around the kitchen table and the next day I'd do two rounds around the kitchen table and it's so small, but it was something that was telling myself, see, you matter. You're doing something for yourself right now. And my kids could do it right beside me. Oh, love it. Yeah. Um, so now that we've done ride the storm, that's just really for your most stressful moments. Then we have given ourselves some time and energy. The third stage is about diffusing the situation. So now that we're calm, now that we have energy, we can access our own logical thinking brain. So we can create a plan for ourselves ahead of the moment to use in the moment. I know that sounds weird, but you're coming up with your plan long before it happens. And you're saying, okay, my kids are fighting or my daughter is refusing to eat again, or my kid is not going to school, or, oh my gosh, I got another call from school. So you're coming up with what are you going to say, do, and provide in the heat of the moment that's going to de-escalate the situation. And again, it's not about solving. It's not about fixing. And this is where a lot of people who are kind of new to this strategy feel like you're letting kids get away with stuff because you're not setting the firm boundary in the heat of the moment is not where you set the firm boundary in the heat of the moment is where you de-escalate where you connect where you try to get quickly assess what's going on and then after everyone's calm now you can start problem solving mm. but you can't do any of that you know in the heat of the moment when your kid is punching your you know the other kid you can't be like we don't punch in this house that is going in deaf ears like they're not hearing that at all and so it really is more about getting closer and lower it's doing a quick assessment of what's under the surface it's swapping your own thoughts from they always fight to you know when they're tired they fight fight a lot so just like a slight shift and then that empower piece is knowing what you're going to say do and provide in the heat of the moment and then tweaking it after and saying, okay, that didn't work. When I say I notice, my kids get more mad. So I'm going to say, you know, hmm, it looks like I might change it just a little bit just to see what is working. And it's not about remembering 50 different scripts. It's just I'm going to try one, what I believe works with my unique family, and I'm going to tweak it after I use it. Mm -hmm. 
I love it. And I, I agree with you. I think so often we're looking for that specific script. Uh, I know in the moment with my daughter, when I say, it looks like you're feeling angry, it infuriates her, infuriates her. Mm -hmm. um, and she actually knows the word validation now. She'll say to me after, I was like, mom, I hate it when you use your therapist voice and I hate it when you do validation. Mm -hmm. so yep. A lot of kids don't like, especially our extra sensitive ones, especially our kids who are really empathetic. They they kind of feel like they're being therapized, you know, or they're the patient and they don't want that in the heat of the moment. They just want to feel heard. And so sometimes it's just like, mm hmm, mm hmm, I hear you. Mm hmm. Right. And it's like that. I have one kid. That's all I can do is like, I hear that you don't want to go to school. That's it. That's all I say. And then we just wait it out. And then afterwards we get clear on why don't we want to go to school? Where are we feeling it? What is going on? What are we worried about? But right then it's like, mm -hmm. right. And if she starts to hit, cause sometimes she will, she won't hit with her hands. She'll like push me away with her feet and, um, or she'll grunt, you know, like that. And she'll say, go away. And I'll say, I hear you saying go away but I also see that you want me near. So if you kick me, I have to kind of step away a little. Can you give me a sign if you want me here or to go away? And I might like do a hand signal or something like that. And she can grunt, stay here or go away, you know, or she'll say space, right? Space means I want my space. And then I'll just come back. Is it time? And she'll go, yes. And I'll come and sit by her and then we can talk it out. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So now that you have an in the moment plan and this one, you can uh, tweak quite a bit. And I feel like you go between like, I feel like people will go between in the moment plan and I had the moment plan back and forth, kind of like that. And, and I caution people don't get stuck in a ride the storm plan waiting until you're always calm because we're humans, right? We're all going to mess up. We're all going to yell one day or another. And so you know, a lot of times I see people get stuck at that first stage waiting until they're always calm or they have tons of energy and they don't progress. And you need those teeny tiny steps forward to feel momentum, because when you feel momentum, then you feel, you know, empowered to do it again, try it again. And with repetition, you get mastery. And so I encourage people to keep going, even though it's like, ah, oh, this feels iffy. I don't feel really comfortable yet. So the um, ahead of the moment stage is that proactive part. It's really looking at it more holistically. You're actually involving your kids now because now you've built trust. They know you're their safe place. They know they can be themselves even if it's ugly in the moment. Mm -hmm. Like they know that you're there for them. And so now the you piece, that thought part, is about focusing in on just one challenge at a time because when we have kids even especially if we have multiple kids we can be like well there's this problem and that problem and this problem and this problem and what happens is we never feel like we're making forward movement and so it's really important to pick just one thing to focus on so that your kids don't feel like you're constantly nagging them about everything and then folk keep that focus until you've created some plans that really work to solve that problem. And so that's the you piece. And then the connection piece is actually done out of the moment. Yeah. It's about building positive interactions and intentional moments of connection. It's less about play. It's more about, you know, I'm going to sit with you while you talk to me. I'm going to, um, like my son just got home from his dad's after, you know, a two week stint at his dad's and, it was, you know, he was very like snippy and, and, and kind of, um, jarring. And so I was like, how can I build? I just kept saying, build positive interactions, build positive moments, build like in my head. Yeah. So I was like, how can I build that connection? And so I was like, Hey, when you're done with that anime show, do you want to come and help me build my Lego typewriter? And he was like, yeah. You know, and then um, he was like, well, can you come watch the anime show with me? So I sat down and I watched the anime show and I don't like anime, but I still watched it. And then, you know, he started talking to me now and he starts telling me things he did at his dad's and it was stuff that I don't agree with. So he starts telling me about he, how he shot some guns at his dad's house. And I just was like, oh, really? And what did you like about it? What did you not like about it? 
And he was expecting a reaction out of me. And instead he just got acceptance and he just got, you know, a conversation. And that is the rebuild that's needed so that when we need to problem solve for something else, like, hey, we need to work through a new routine for getting up in the morning, or we need to work on some new chores in the house. Like it's going to be so much easier to work through that because we have a good relationship. Beautiful. Um, yeah. And then the understand piece for ahead of the moment is something we call the behavior spiral. Um, and like I said, the book is full of doodles. And so you've got a good doodle there. But imagine um, if you ever like gone to a wishing well, those ones where you put the penny in and then it swirls around. Yeah. So think of that. Think of the, the bottom, the epicenter, right? Like the behavior, the big meltdown. So, you know, you put a penny in and it goes round, round, around, and then goes into the bottom, into the black hole. Well, the further down or closer to the bottom you are grabbing that penny and stopping it from going in, you're actually going to push it in, right? It's like almost impossible to grab. And then if you grab it at the top, it never got any momentum, right? So it's not really doing anything either. And so when you think of behavior that way, it's not one moment. It really is this spiral, this buildup. And so if you can unravel it and try to pinpoint what's the tipping point where it's the point of no return, where there's no amount of conversation, no amount of strategizing, no amount of problem solving, no amount of validating that's going to work here. That's where we place our in the moment plans or our ahead of the moment plans is like, oh, when you start getting jabby with your conversation, we're done. Like I, there's, we're, we've hit point of no return. It's all about riding the storm now. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Which is what I love what you said is that we, if we invest in our own vehicle first as yes. mamas, daddies, grandmas listening in, we can actually ride that storm with it. Mm -hmm. and if it's, mm -hmm. We're operating on zero. It's so hard. It's so hard, especially the first time, you know, and I hear this a lot, like the first time you can handle it. The second time you might be okay. But by the third time you're like not handling it so well. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, and, and just to be honest, like I'm human, so I still mess up. So, you know, I just got back from Kenya and I went with my 15 turning 16 year old and we spent the whole time in our tents together. Like we, he didn't get a separate tent. We were constantly together. So by about day four, things were getting a little, like we were doing really well, but by day four, we needed to pack to go to safari hmm. and he refused to put his jog pants in. We have to pack into a soft suitcase. You can't take like the heavy suitcase. Yeah. And so he was going to leave behind his jog pants. And I was like, but it might get cold. And he was like, nope, don't need them. And I was like, but you don't know if you're going to need them. Like, what's the harm in taking them? Well, he was done. Like, he was so tired and he was like, hadn't eaten well, hadn't slept well for four days that he was just not having it. And I was not having it either. And I was like, I don't understand. Why are you doing this to me? Why won't you just put them in your bag? This makes no sense. Why are you shutting down on me? And I just spiraled out of control. Then I'm yelling and he goes, well, you're yelling at me. I'm done now. Mm -hmm. And he just like shut down, which is the best thing he could have done. But then it just made me even more mad. I'm like, oh, don't you shut down on me. You know? <laughs> so like it just... It happens to the best of us when we're tired, when we're exhausted and we don't have, we haven't been taking care of ourselves. Like it's really hard to access that like calmness to be able to ride it out. Cause I could have just been like, okay, pack and don't say anything. And then, you know, when he's calm and when he's fed and when he's slept, I could have been like, oh, by the way, I brought your jog pants and I got them washed. Here they are. Mm -hmm. It's but just to hear the humanness of it, right? We're all messy. <laughs> we're all messy and we're all trying. Um, yeah. And I just, I don't, I think if we can change that conversation in parenting around, I messed up or I made a mistake or I'm the worst parent, I'm a terrible parent. If we can erase that out of parent conversation, well, not only will it help our parent child relationships, but like it'll help our children be able to have better confidence. Cause if they're hearing us and seeing us beat ourselves up when we mess up, then they're like, Oh, I'm not supposed to make mistakes either. 
and our like highly sensitive spirited kids, like they are going to make sure that they're not making mistakes if that's what they're supposed to do. hundred percent. I agree with you. Yeah. Dana power swaps. That was one of the thing I wanted to make sure we touched base on today. Yeah. So that is, uh, so thought swaps. And so the thought swaps are this idea, um, and we use them in the moment, but you can use them anytime. And the idea is that we have these disempowering thoughts that come into our head and they just steal our joy. They steal our calm. And if we can have something on the ready, on the go to swap them with, then it makes it so much easier to get out of that negative headspace and move forward. So Example of my son in the hotel room. Had I had a thought swap ready, I would have not spiraled the way that I did. So what thought came up is he's so like disrespectful. That was what I kept coming up in my head. And like, he doesn't appreciate anything. So it was like these really big, heavy thoughts because we had just left a village, a remote village in Kenya where people lived in a house that was smaller than our hotel room, right? And I was just like, he's so unappreciative. He's so disrespectful. And I even made the mistake of saying, I don't know why I even brought you, right? So you end up saying things that you would never say any other time because the thoughts are going through your head. And so I would say that that would be negative Nelly took over. Um, so we like to depersonalize them. So we've got negative Nelly. We've got the always and never beast. We've got, um, who else do we have? Oh, we have Judgy McJudgerson, which is like all the thoughts of other people. So all these, like, na we name them and we're like, oh, Judgy McJudgerson's back. And so if you could say, oh, you know what? Like negative Nelly, go away. Fact finder Freddy, come on in and help me find the proof that he is appreciative, that he is respectful, that he is caring. And, you know, maybe, hey, Dive and Dana, can you come in here and look under the surface for me? Like what's under the surface? So when you already have a pair of thought monsters and super swaps that you can use for your most common go to like negative thoughts, it makes it easier in the moment to show up, swap those thoughts and then be there for your kids. That's fabulous. I love that. Yeah. Love so and they're excellent later to teach your kids, not in the moment, but they're excellent as skill building and coping strategies to teach your kids ahead of the moment. Well, I mean, that's emotion regulation right there, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Dana, any final words for parents listening? In? I mean, I think we touched on it a little bit, but I just, I think if the only thing you got out of this conversation is just that, you are not failing and that your child's not broken and that you're exactly the parent that your child needs, then I think I've done my job, right? Like I want anyone listening to this to just know that they're doing a great job. They don't have to get it perfect and they're not alone. Huge. Yeah. Uh, where can parents and professionals find your book? Yeah, so you can go to calmthechaosbook.com and we've got a bunch of goodies for you. And if you're not sure if you love it yet, you can download a free chapter um, and there'll be all kinds of fun information there for you. Amazing. Dana, thank you so much. Thank you.